First up, can you please give a very warm welcome to Simon James and Magnus Fitchett from Publis Sapient. <laughs> All yours. Good uh, morning, everyone. I'm Magnus, and this is uh, Cy. Um, and as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about customer experience, which we're going to refer to as CX for abbreviation as we go, go through, and the imperative to uh, stand out, not fit in, if you want to actually grow your business. So we've got some slides and some obligatory stats to sort of frame the conversation. I think it follows on from uh, some of the previous speakers. So the first stat is 89% of companies are primarily competing on CX. So this is a massive importance for the growth of business. Not surprisingly, you know, three in four are saying it's their top objective. You are saying it is your top objective in terms of uh, as an area of investment. And the investment that's going into it is one in every four pounds is roughly spent on CX. And in fact, for some of you in this room, uh, for about 50%, it's almost um, uh, two out of every four pounds. So this is a big area, important focus. Bit of an inconvenient truth is a lot of what has been talked about this morning in, in terms of digital transformation programs are resulting in, in failure. A failure to meet the objectives in which you actually set out to achieve. Depending upon the study you look at, it's anywhere between 70% uh, and about 80, I think 3%, uh, 84% of uh, companies are failing to meet that CX objectives. There is some good news. All our investment in digital transformation is uh, resulting in actually companies getting better at adapting to change, adapting to new kind of customer needs. And our own analysis at Publicis Sapient says that actually today, companies globally in the financial services space is taking between four to six months to go from an idea that you've got, maybe a proposition or a feature, to live in the market. That's a rough global kind of view. That's halved from, uh, it's got you know, much quicker over the last five years. There's been a massive impact, so there's really good momentum there. However, that ability to, with the speed, is as soon as somebody is launching a new feature, a new proposition, the ability to copy. And what we're seeing is a, what I would describe as a sea of sameness. Um, and if you look at things like mobile apps that one of the previous speakers was talking about, everyone's in the rough ball, same ballpark when you're looking at you know, scores on something like Apple Store or something like that, you know, 4.5 to 4.9 kind of score. Everyone's roughly the same. So how do you work out how much to invest in CX and where do you invest and how do you drive standout? Well, given that the C in CX is about customer, we thought the best place to begin is looking at customers themselves, kind of in their own words, where uh, we scraped over 100,000 customer reviews from publicly available sources. And we filtered those reviews for only five-star reviews, so only where people are very happy about the service they're getting from the bank. And then we used some natural language processing to analyze the patterns that exist for different brands, particularly when you compare them uh, against each other. And, and that's what we've generated some observations here. Um, this is an obligatory, complicated chart to prove they've actually done the work and not just kind of summarize this at a very high level. But basically, the blue area is terms that predominantly appear in Starling five-star reviews that don't appear in Monzo reviews. And conversely, the red area is terms that appear in Monzo five-star reviews that don't appear in styling reviews to try to work out the spaces that these kind of companies occupy dealing in this sameness, this commoditized view around uh, the mobile app. And, and, and thankfully, I've summarized this so you don't have to read uh, every single thing on here. But basically, when you look at two challenger banks in the UK, um, they're ultimately competing over features. This is a battleground over features. The things that people talk about relating to Monzo is the early payday, bill splitting, being able, being able to upload your contacts so you can pay people directly. Um, on Starling's side, it's a zero, but you know, uh, 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 accounting integration, being able to deposit cash at a post office and having different accounts in different currencies. And in the middle, they have kind of different terms for the same thing, which is really splitting up your money into spaces or pots. So, you know, very much a black and white competition over features. But if you compare Monzo with a random, and we took this at random, High Street Bank, what you see is for the High Street Bank, the language is extremely different, very different. So whilst for Monzo, you still get the kind of the features that are the things that stand out. For Barclays, uh, Barclays reviews, five-star reviews, are 28 times more likely to feature the word kind 
in some way, or polite, or patient, or, or positive comments about being spoken to, and ultimately five times more helpful. Um, and the, the initial brief for this talk was like, what are the seven rules for CX? And the reality is there aren't seven golden rules. Um, if there was, everyone would be doing the same thing. It's actually what's true to you and your brand is more important to understand, bring that out. That's how you stand out, is by being true to the, the strengths you have as a business, not just copycatting um, the experience. So Peter Drucker said you can't manage what you don't measure. So how do you measure experiences and beyond the kind of MPS and the CSAT scores that we're all looking at? And, and how does that measurement of it help inform how you create standout and how you can grow as an organization? Fortunately, there's been quite a lot of work done around how experiences work. This uh, gentleman, Can uh, Daniel Kahneman, um, who is a, um, so some of you might have read the book, I'm sure, long, and um, uh, he, he's uh, uh, effectively a Nobel Prize winning um, economist and psychologist. Um, and, and he drummed it down into this, which is, we do not choose between experiences, we choose between the memory of, of experiences. And for those that have read his books, he actually taught, he's, a, he's also a professor, and he, and he uses one story to illustrate this which is the story of one of his students, massively into classical music, listening to a symphony, enjoyed the symphony, and right at the very end, there was a loud screeching sound. And the student said, that completely ruined the experience for me. It didn't ruin the experience, it, it, it ruined the memory of the experience. And actually, this was interesting, because actually, it's, you have your experienced self and your remembered self, and it's your rem remembered self that makes future decisions. So when we were thinking, well, what, how do we measure this? We started to do exploratory work within the financial services industry. So how can we take that theory of the remembered self and apply it? And so we did some exploratory research with all of your customers. Um, and what we saw is a new emergent model, which we, of the way experience works and how you create memorable experiences. And we call it a CX growth index. Quite simple, there are three things in this quantitative study that we've now encoded in, and we're asking three questions. The first one is, what was the quality of the experience? Did you get what you wanted from it? And how was that compared with your expectations? And what was interesting there, it's not the expectations within the people in this room, but it's expectations of not just financial services, but every experience you've had. And the score was dictated by the emotional reaction that had to it. You know, how good did it feel? Did it have a, a positive or, or negative emotional action that gave us effectively a score around how experiences worked. And what we discovered is m for most financial services brands, it was in this kind of what we'd call the valley of kind of meh. Like, yeah, it wasn't really, you know, you're kind of going, well, eh, does it something I remember? Actually, it's, you don't remember it at all. And actually, there's only very few companies which either have a really bad experience or a really good experience that you remember, and it's those companies are the companies that are growing. Uh, and I come back for a chart. Um, and what we uh, measured overall is every, every retail bank in the UK split into kind of established and challenger brands, and we, we compared the scores from the CXGX um, versus the net growth of the current account users, basically. And what we find is a really strong relationship between the two. So what we're trying to do with the experience is find a metric that actually helps businesses grow and can help predict growth in the future. Now, um, over time, we're looking to kind of strengthen this relationship and make sure it's true. But we also ask customers um, in their own behavior, would they be more likely or less likely to use a bank in the future? And so we've both got the net growth externally, but also the claimed behavior of people in the survey to kind of tie our score to uh, uh, measures of growth. So just in terms of kind of key takeaways here, um, if you want to grow your business in terms of the, and get more from your investment in customer experience, you need to measure it differently. One, you need to look at the quality of experience, which we've been doing for, you know, quite a long time, but we need to look at it in, in comparison with the expectations set within the industry and looking at the emotional reaction that you have and the, and, and the creation it's got. And those, that drives you to something that allows you to look and focus as an organization on what are the moments in the experience, usually often at the end of the experience, when you can create something that's highly memorable. And if you can create something memorable, that's something that's going to result in you standing out from the crowd and result in you being a growth 
company and one of the ones in the kind of top right of that chart. We are uh, writing a report on this for all of which we've covered all of the uh, UK uh, retail banks within it. Um, it's not out yet, but you can, if you take your phone out, you can, uh, uh, you might need to zoom at the back and you can pre-register um, on here and we'll send you out a free copy of the report once uh, Cy and I have actually finished writing it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Brilliant. Simon has to leave us, but thank you so much. I forgive you for the dots. My eyes are confused, but I'm sure they'll straighten up eventually. But thank you so much for that. Stay with us, please, because I also want to welcome to the stage Tanya Retta from NatWest so that we can follow up some of those key points which came through on that study. Please give her a welcome. <laughs> it's good to see you, Tanya. OK, and you'll be delighted to know that you've drawn the short straw for the opening question. But look, fantastic. it was a fantastic presentation as well. So much there, but look, that presentation happens against a backdrop of digitalization. Okay? It is a digital world in which we're living, but how can a bank demonstrate its humanity and empathy when you have an architecture which is technological? Can everything about a high street bank be digitized? Great question, Juliet, to kick me off. Thank you. It's um, my pleasure. It's, it's been a. <laughs> Uh, you know, and listening to the backdrop of the last few speakers, actually we've been hearing a lot of this theme come through already. So digital banking and the needs of customers to actually do things easier at their fingertips whenever they want to is, is something that we're seeing trending as a very high prevalence now. And that was before we had the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now post it, it's, it's gone extra, extra dential now, it's gone much faster. So wherever we look whether it's in banking or in our normal everyday lives people want to be able to do things easier so digital banking definitely is something that we need to support our customers with and we see certainly in that west 60 percent of our customers just digitally bank as we heard earlier on sure. through an earlier speaker at the same time <laughs> finances is a complex complex conversation it's a difficult subject particularly if you're not involved in it and there are definitely moments that matter for our customers that we have to be absolutely brilliant at and that isn't always serviced on its own by digital technology and that's where the really high human touch value comes in so having that emotional connectivity making sure that we can really understand truly our customer needs is going to be important so how do we make that work well if i look at as we went through um, the pandemic before pandemic half one uh, 2020 we were averaging around about 800 video interviews a week without without 800 800 as we came into the end of 2021 that number had jumped up to 10,000 on average a week so so there's something about actually making sure that we can combine the technology that we have at our fingertips and actually having great conversations with our customers connecting with them emotionally to help them through those really really important times in their lives because mm, as Luna said you you need at the very beginning the first keynote address you need to get everybody on board and you shouldn't really put them in the position where they have to use their mobile phone because not everybody does have one but look Magnus on the strength of what you've just heard and that presentation, what is it that separates the winners from the losers? Once upon a time, it was the amount of technology you had, how successful you were with using it, but it's gone beyond that. So what are the keys to success here for the, for the customer experience, the CX journey? I think the uh, technology is the easy part. Um, the, uh, the battleground is the experience space. And I think there would be, in terms of winning in the experience space, there's probably kind of three things. One is really obvious that everyone, previous talk, uh, speakers have talked about, which is, you know, you've got to be customer-led, not competitor-led, um, which I think is easier said than actually done because it challenges perhaps your existing business model, maybe it, you know, affects short-term kind of profitability. So I think, but as an industry, I think we're getting better there at being customer-led. Secondly, um, you've got to be able to you know, change fast to meet customer expectations because they're changing all the time. So the ability to adapt, so you know, breaking down the silos within the organization, new ways of working, everyone in this room will have been kind of through some form of kind of change program. And again, as an industry, I think we've got better there. The third thing though, links to what I was, uh, or what we were talking about is you've got to be renowned for something and to create memorable experiences. And I think that is where we collectively as an industry need to work much, much harder. If we want to be successful and we want to grow, we've got to look at how do we become renowned. And a lot of that is going to be looking 
internally and, and looking, looking both at our brand and what we stand for as well as um, at a comp uh, customers. Mm. But, but Tanya, all very well and good, a great aspiration to have, but at the mm. end of the day, you need to strike a balance, the balance between the needs of your colleagues. They've got yep. to be trained to do all of this, to smash down the silos that we, we just heard about, but also combining that with the customers in that digital transformation, because let's face it, some customers are scared of it. Yeah, uh, and, and you, you, you're absolutely right. You've got to keep the balance. And the first thing you start with um, certainly for us is to make sure that you've got a very clear purpose organisationally so that people align behind what it is you stand for, underpinned by strong strategy and priorities to make sure that happens. And at NatWest, what we've also done to help us achieve that is bring our people and our transformation work together in one key function that enables us to really drive the transformation through our people so that they're part of the conversation, they're part of the actual outcomes and the way in which we're going to do things differently for our customers. That's been really, really important for us. Second thing is actually recognizing where you don't have the skills necessarily internally, but also where you want to really leverage great external partnerships and bring in great ideas to the organization that can actually really bolster what you're doing. And we're doing that with Amazon, Google, and Meta at the moment. And, and thirdly, and in fact, Magnus, you just touched on it, ways of working, you know, both ways, whether, whether it's in terms of actually how we're now operating, now that we're slowly coming back to the workplace, or whether it is we're still working from home. How do we make sure we're remaining agile? How, how do we make sure we're really supporting our teams to collaborate, connect, engage, and actually do all the learning that you just talked about as well? That's mm -hmm. really important. And, and Magnus, in that presentation, I mean, it used the word copycatting, basically, that banks are copying from one another and it's resulting from a certain degree of, of commoditization of experience. But I guess that if you just copy, it makes you a bit complacent because you're just looking within a certain group. So where else should banks be looking for that inspiration if they're to actually stand above the crowd and offer something that is different that people like me will want to go to? Yeah, <clears throat> good question. So um, yeah, I think if you are, find yourself, you know, no one's a leader if you're copying. So if you find yourself copying all of the features of other um, of, of your competitors, you're really not a leader in the in the space. So you know where do you need to take your inspiration from? Well, you're going to have to take it from from customers. So you're going to have to be customer led, which we talked about before. But I think something that Tanya uh, just touched on, which is like purpose, you're going to have to go in and look at. And, and Simon kind of covered it in one of the charts. But the the DNA of your business and the purpose of your organisation, and look at you know how do you show up you know, differently as a bank. Um, and it's there where you can find a rich seam of opportunity to create kind of memorable experiences that cannot be copied as quickly or others do not have the right to copy in the same fashion. Mm. So customer and, and absolutely your brand and, and what you stand for. Yeah, I mean, look, we've, we've had two keynote addresses from HSBC and Handels Bank. And, and within that, we've heard about what it is they're doing to make sure that that customer experience, the CX, stands out. Tell me about it from that West perspective. Yeah. What, what is it that you're doing? How are you reimagining that customer journey? And, and it is interesting because to, to Magnus's speech earlier on with Sai, it is all about how do you bring to life the experience. Um, and I would say a couple of things. Firstly, it's really important behind that strategy and the priorities and the purpose that you've got a strong investment bed as well so that actually digital and technology is really well invested. And in that West, we've got over 80% of our three billion budget over three years being invested in digital and technology. That really allows us to leverage the data and the way in which we operate to make sure that we're servicing what our customers' needs are. So we're starting to anticipate their needs and working with them to understand how they're evolving. That's really, really important. Um, that enables us also to make sure we're investing well in the way in which we operate. So um, my, my role is to make sure we're delivering value through our customer journeys. Also colleague journeys. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <coughs> also, also colleague journeys, because it is about our people that will drive the transformations I've touched on. So making sure we invest well in our colleagues as well as our customers, really, really important to us. And, and one additional way which I'd, I'd leave on probably is in terms of diff doing things differently is is building that closer and deeper relationships with customers. And an example I would give is, is really in our youth market where we thought really carefully about how do we connect with the youth of today and tomorrow? Um, this is not about all our customers today. These are about actually how do we support our communities and our broader families around us? 
Um, and we've done a couple of things in the last year which you may have heard about in terms of announcements. But firstly, we, we've partnered with um, Marcus Rashford to look at the initiatives that we can do with our school-age children, um, thinking about from a money-wise and also career sense perspective, how we can support them to think about their finances in a healthy way, to have healthy relationships with their money. Um, we've also partnered with Rooster. Um, to look at an app for our parents and our children on actually how they can be supported to help look after their pocket money and their money and actually gain that sense of independence and help around the value of money and actually what does that mean and look like. And then at the same time, we're also expanding internally. How do we actually connect with the youth of today? And that's not, that's not us, unfortunately. <laughs> so, you know, we're using our social media networks. Um, we've got a great team now on TikTok, uh, doing some influencing work for us, giving some great market research across the youth that are actually going to be able to support us thinking about what are the solutions for tomorrow. So all those things really start to, to build out where we've actually got at the moment around about 86% of our retail digital off uh, and our digital offerings for our retail customers. So some things more to do, but definitely some good progress made. Okay, and we're all youths in here. Remember, you're only as old as you feel. We all feel 16, so we are youths in this room, okay? But look, Tanya, we're going to have to leave it there. And also, Magnus, thank you so much for that. There's a lot more that I could discuss with both of you, but sadly, time goes against us. There's plenty of ground to cover. But before we close out completely, just to let you know that Simon and Magnus, they do have a lot to say. Trust me on this. They're going to be around in the Barista Lounge afterwards if you have any questions. So please go in, say hello, and you can tell, tell them some more about the reports as well. But uh, look, Magnus and Tanya, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.